good morning. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. It looks like a lot of excitement out there, good fellowship going on. Uh, if you'll stand and join me, we're going to get started with the song service, uh, 214 in your red hymnals. 214, I know that my Redeemer liveth. of the crew that thinks so, wishes so, wonders so, maybe so, I thank God I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. I thank God I know I have eternal, everlasting, shall never perish life. And uh, I'm, I don't have those things because I'm good. I have those things because Jesus is good. Amen. He didn't overlook my sin. He washed it away. And gave me eternal life, and I am forever grateful, forever indebted to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you're here. We want to welcome the folk on live stream, and I'm pretty certain we have some extra people watching this morning. And uh, to you, we say hello, and if you're sick, get well, and if you're, if you're out of town, hurry back, but be safe about it, and uh, we'll see you next time. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. We have some announcements we want to share with you. Uh, first off, we want to say that uh, I want to say... Thank you for the continued food supply. If, uh, if you've heard on the news that there's a shortage of food, uh, you come over to the house and I'll prove to you that's not exactly true. I appreciate every dish that's come. Man, I've had pancakes and, and potato cakes and cornbread and beans and, and soups of all kinds and, and uh, uh, pot pie. And I, 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 have, just, I have just enjoyed eating, and uh, I trust that uh, you'll continue to pray that uh, uh, Miss Judy will get back soon. She tested again yesterday. She's still testing positive. And in the mornings, she said mornings are worse for her, and she struggles to get from the bed to a, to a recliner out in the living room. And then she says, I have to wait there for a while because I don't have the strength to get back. Yesterday, she was able, with some help, to get outside for a couple of hours in the sunlight, and she said that felt good anyway. She has no fever. She has not lost her taste. She has not lost her smell, and uh, she did have a fever in, uh, on M Monday, but she's just, just wiped out, and when she test, takes the test, it comes back positive. And so pray for her, if you will. She's, she's praying that God will let the, when she tests tomorrow, that God will show that to be negative, and then if her, as her strength increases, right now she couldn't navigate through, a, through a, an airport. That would be impossible for her to do. Even with her having a wheelchair, it would still be a difficult, difficult situation. And so she's hoping that she'll be back here on scene by Thursday. If you'd pray to that end, I would very much appreciate that. 
And then let me mention, too, that uh, uh, we had a great Sunday school class this morning. And uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Burwell, he said us, told us this morning that she writes the sermons and he preaches them. You did good, Ms. Burwell. That was, a, that was a good message that you gave to your husband this morning. And uh, I appreciate that. Looking forward to him preaching this morning. And then uh, the afternoon service also. There'll be dinner here at the, at the church uh, this afternoon. And uh, excited about that. We always, we always have a, a good time of fellowship. Uh, Brother Burwell read the text this morning in Acts chapter 2, and it tells us that 25% of the, dis the discipleship program of that first church was fellowship. Fellowship. And uh, here's, here's a secret that the devil doesn't want you to know. When you don't feel like coming to church, you come, and there's somebody there that's so excited you'll leave excited. And when they don't feel like coming to church, if they'll come and you'll be there and you're excited, they'll leave excited. And so we kind of we kind of need each other in that respect. And so God has established a church for that purpose, among some other things, getting the gospel to all, all creatures. So I ask you, please, to, to pray about that. Stay for the afternoon service and the fellowship and then an afternoon uh, 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 service to this afternoon when uh, dinner's over. And then uh, Wednesday night we'll be in the book of Revelation, the the most the most uh, populated uh, prayer meeting of all time takes place in the latter part of uh, when that sixth seal is opened. Uh, the most, the, the, man, people everywhere, every walk of life start praying. But it's too late. It's too late. I pastored in Colorado Springs uh, for eight years, and of course, we're, NORAD is up there, and they, we had men that worked up there that were members of our church, and they talk about the metal doors that an atomic bomb can't, can't uh, hurt and all those things. And, uh, but I've always wondered if that's not one of the places where they'll be crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and save them from the wrath of God. Wow, I'm sure glad I'm saved. I'm sure glad I'm saved. And I, we need to study the Word of God so we'll help other people to be glad they're saved after they get that way. Here's some things we need to pray about, if you would, please. Uh, Brother Leslie, I have not seen him yet this morning. I don't know that he's coming. Uh, his mama passed away last night. And, of course, that's always a, a hard pill to swallow. Uh, she had COVID, and his daddy has it also. And his dad is getting better, but his dad has reached a point. I think he's 83 years young, and he doesn't really understand all that's going on. And so uh, the Leslie family needs our prayers for sure. And then uh, Miss Alex's sister, Valerie, about the same, about the same. She is in desperate need of prayer. She does claim to be our sister in Christ. We can pray for her. Miss Jesse Johnson, uh, Brother Jesse's wife, uh, I was going to tell you her name, but it slips my mind. Miss Candace, yes. Uh, she's, uh, had to go, she had one real good day. She was able to eat, and they thought, well, this is really working. And the next day she went to the hospital hemorrhaging real bad. And I've not heard since then, but uh, she needs our prayers. Mrs. Nez, uh, let me share this. We've been praying for Mrs. Nez. She's going to have a baby, you know, and they, they know that the baby's going to have some complications when it arrives. Brother Nez is very faithful to write. And uh, I won't read the entire letter, but I want to read one part for your, your thought this morning. It says, Ms. Amber was scheduled to have a C-section on the 4th of August, 2022, but baby Nez uh, decided it was time to come out. He, we, I took her to the hospital, and the doctors were very concerned for the baby and Ms. Uh, Amber's health. Jo Josiah David Nez was delivered on July the 8th, 2022. Baby Josiah will remain in the NICU here in Phoenix, Arizona for several more weeks. Please pray for his health and the recovery for my wife. We are grateful for Josiah and we thank God for his gift to us. Thank you for uh, investment here uh, on the Navajo Reservation. May God continue to bless you richly in Christ, Ryan Nez. And so we need to Amen. pray for him and, and for their entire family. And then, if you want to see the rest of the letter, come back Wednesday, and Brother Weaver will share it with us. Amen. So uh, praise the Lord for good missionaries and missionaries that report. And while I'm saying that, let me say this. One of the best reporting missionaries we have is, is Brother Burwell. 
He's one of the most faithful reporting missionaries that we have. And I think he's the longest missionary that we've had. I, the church was supporting him when I came, and they still are if he doesn't mess up today. <laughs> and so uh, we're very, very thankful that he's here and uh, trust that we'll have a good time with him. Pray for our missions program. Uh, let's see, Kenny Heinbach. This is a friend of Brother, Brother Rollins, and he did some work on Old Yeller out here and uh, got it back on the road for us one time in the past. And uh, he's suffering uh, from uh, illnesses now. We need to pray for him. There are several members and friends of Bethel Baptist Church that are under the weather. Ask you please just to pray that God will give us a healthy church. Continue to pray for America, for Israel, for Jerusalem, for our missions program. And then uh, pray for Mrs. Rollins, who's traveling. It's supposed to come home tomorrow, I think. And uh, ask you please to pray for her to have safety on the way back. And then, of course, if you would, I would appreciate prayer for my wife. Uh, amen. Brother Weaver, step up here. No, oh, 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 excuse me. I'm sorry, brother. Let me do this first. This is from uh, Miss Michelle, and it says, uh, Proverbs 27, verse 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Dear beloved church, thank you so, so much for the generous gift of $100. I will be using the money to buy uh, to pay for textbooks and other mandatory school expenses. Thank you uh, evermore, uh, so, evermore. Yes, your, oh, thank you uh, even more, excuse me, thank you even more for your love, your many prayers, your friendship, your support for uh, my family, me and my family uh, all these years. It really means so much. Uh, to me, and I would not be the person I am today if it were not for your friendship. I love this church family with all my heart, and thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Love, Michelle Amigal. And so, uh, where's she at? Oh, there she is right there. God bless you. Amen. We're glad that you're here with us today. All right. Uh, I think with that, Brother Weaver, you can come pray for us, please, and then just lead us in another song. Father, I just thank you bringing everybody out today, Lord, just giving us the freedom to continue to gather and assemble. Uh, Lord, just thank you for, for your faithfulness in, uh, in uh, protecting us and watching over us. And uh, Lord, indeed, there are a number of folks who are ill and not with us today, and I pray that you would do a mighty work, Lord, that you just bring uh, health and healing. Uh, Lord, that you would just use these things in, in each life, uh, Lord, to, to see uh, what you have to teach us or what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, Lord, we certainly pray for Brother Leslie. Uh, and uh, their family. Father, uh, it's, it's uh, hard to, to lose a parent, and I just uh, pray that you would just do a mighty work, Lord, just giving him a peace that passes understanding. Uh, Lord, I know it's very hard for him not to be able to, to, uh, to go and, and uh, be there, but um, that's, that's the way it is, and I pray that you would just give him a peace, and then, uh, Lord, you put people in, this, in the right place to, to help and uh, um, be a benefit and a service to his father as he's continuing to struggle with sickness as well. Lord, we do pray that Miss Judy would be able to uh, heal up and be able to return home uh, in the near future. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you just give her an added measure of grace. Uh, Lord, to strengthen each day just for, uh, just, and you just help her to, to heal up and recover quickly. Uh, Father, we, uh, there's several more folks that are, are we've been continuing to pray for, uh, Miss Valerie and uh, Mrs. Uh, Jesse Johnson. And uh, Lord, we just um, uh, pray that you just continue to do a work, giving uh, grace each day. Lord, just giving strength. Um, Lord, uh, we just ask for your mercies uh, in, in their life and health situations. And Lord, we praise you for um, the Nez baby. Uh, Lord, I pray that that young man would uh, grow to, to uh, grow up to love you. He'd been um, raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Father, that he would uh, come to Christ early because he's uh, just been inundated with your word from day one and be, even before. And uh, Father, that you would just use that young man to, to reach many, many more there at the reservation. And uh, he followed in his father's footsteps. And, Lord, you just um, uh, guard him and protect him. Uh, Lord, there may be some concerns about some health issues, but, uh, Lord, you can deal with those too. And I pray that you would just resolve those for him and uh, use him mightily for your name. Father, we thank you. Thank you for a chance to be here, and I pray that your name would be exalted and honored in all that we do, say, and think. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> right, if you'll stand again, please. 204 in your red hymnal. 204, to God be the glory. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
seated while they come forward for a special. said thank you kids so, so for so many years it's difficult not to say that but they're not they're not kids anymore thank you very much appreciate you sharing your talents uh, with us here at Bethel Baptist Church I'm glad that uh, brother Burwell is with us today uh, Miss Judy is is uh, sorry that she's missing him being here she probably is watching on live stream so she'll pick up ever ever dip ever dodge every Thing you do wrong brother I promise you she she is good at critiquing she's practiced on me for 58 years amen so uh, she's going to enjoy it there thank you for those of you who are watching and we are very grateful for the ability that we have to send our message literally around the world we're very thankful for that thankful for those people who work hard in order that we can get that done and so we're glad that uh, you do that brother Burwell you come sir I know God's given you a message. I appreciate the message uh, in Sunday school, and uh, I didn't enjoy it all, but I appreciated it all. <laughs> and uh, God bless you. We're looking forward to hearing what God told you to tell us today. Preacher. Amen. Well, as long as I know you love us, you can tell us whatever I you want to tell us. You. Amen. <laughs> you. All right. Probably going to wish I didn't love you near as much as I do. Um, I'll just say a word before I preach this morning. and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. I hate to be reminded that I'm old, and I'm get, but I'm getting old. I'll be in November, November the 28th, I'll be 77 years of age. Write it, write it down in your Bible. <laughs> November 28th, 77. I like Mercedes Benz, and my favorite color is burgundy, just so you'll know, okay? I, uh, but Mrs. Burwell worries about me because I... I um, 
get disoriented sometimes. And um, I'll tell you a little story that happened. It's been a while back, but um, I, I, I get up early. I get up sometimes, it's usually pretty dark still when I wake up, get up. Miss Burwell gets up every morning at the crack of noon. And uh, so I got up one morning and I went out of the bedroom, didn't want to turn the lights on, didn't want to make any noise because I didn't want to wake her up. And I went out of the bedroom door and slowly shut the door and went in the hallway, house totally dark, couldn't see anything. And, um, and I, got a t- I realized I need to get a t-shirt, so I opened the door, reached into the dresser, got a t-shirt, out in the dark, and I started to put t-shirt on, and I... And you get this story, I couldn't find the hole where your head goes through. I, I put it on, I was trying to get, and I couldn't find the hole for my head, and I was pushing my arm, trying to, and I mean, I just didn't know what was going on. And I didn't want to wake her, but finally I got so, I kind of got scared even. And uh, so I finally opened the door, and I woke her up, I said, Charlotte, I'm having a hard, I can't find the head from a hole to go, a hole for my head, for the I can't get my arm. And she said this, she said, I knew I should not have put those pillowcases in your drawer. <laughs> now, now I'm ready to confess, now I'm ready to confess something that I've not told Mrs. Burwell, she does not know this. I saved it because I knew that if I told her, in church, where everybody is, she there's not much she can do to me in church. <laughs> I, yeah, right. <laughs> but another another deal with my for, uh, disorientation. We've got the best. Car, I don't know if you have them here, but we've got the best car wash you have ever gone through in your life. It's called the Wave Car Wash. Do you all have those here? called the Wave Car Wash. And uh, we wanted to get the car washed before we came here, so we look at least like we're civilized. I didn't know you were going to send rainstorms all the way up here. But so I went to the car wash. I told her, I said, I'm going to go get the car washed, clean the car out for when we go to Pastor Sutton's. I went and got one to the car wash. And it, I mean, this thing, when they, when they bombard you with soap and stuff, it covers your car. You can't, I mean, it is big time. You just have to take my word for it. I went in the car wash, always do two things. I take the antenna off before I go in. And then when I'm going in, I just double check my buttons to make sure my window's not cracked down so that my window's not open. Well, I pressed the button to make sure the window was all the way up, and I pressed the wrong side. And my window went down. And I mean, it was, it was soap. It was, I was being bombarded. Soap was just flying in the car. So I tried to put the, it's her car. That's why I didn't want to tell her. So I put, <laughs> I pushed the button to get the window up. It wouldn't go up. I couldn't get the window up. And I'm going to tell you, I had a mess. I had to take rags and wipe down all the, all the soap. And there's soap all over me. And, um, and uh, I did not know that in that soap, they also have polish. I got the car all wiped down, and I got me all wiped down, and I looked in the mirror, in my rearview mirror, and I had a glow to my face. <laughs> I, I didn't know if I'd been with God and didn't know it or what had happened. <laughs> but I had, a, I had a glow. Now, I will say this. I've tried to find good in everything bad that happens. And uh, I did realize one good thing, and that is our car has never been so clean on the inside as it was after I went through that car wash. But at any rate, that's another evidence of my senility. And oh, at any rate, take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 17, if you will. Exodus chapter number 17. The devil is as real as God is. The Bible calls him the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If you need any proof that Satan's running the world today, just go outside these doors and look at what's going on. I had this thought 
this morning, and I'm trying not to deviate from what I want to say, but I had this thought this morning, and that is if we were honest with what the Bible teaches, preacher, there are more women out in public today that wear the attire of a harlot than has ever been in the history of our world. If you go by the Bible definition, the devil's alive. The devil is real, and he's trying to destroy anything that is good. He wants to destroy you personally. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy Bethel Baptist Church. He wants to destroy our nation, and with our nation, he's done a pretty good job of it. Now, the truth is this. Christians ought to hate the devil. How many of you love God? You ought to hate the devil as much as you love God. Right. Dr. John R. Rice said you can't love flowers unless you hate weeds. Someone asked Brother Rice one time, said, Brother Rice, do you think you'd ever hate the devil so much you'd cuss him? And Dr. Rice looked at the guy and he said, I don't think I'd say the words, but he said, if you'll write them on paper, I'll sign it. We ought to hate the devil this morning. Years ago, and I'm going to speak to you on this subject this morning, how to beat the devil out of the devil. How to beat the devil out of the devil. Years ago, when I was pastoring in the area, in Waldorf or Clinton area, we had a grandmother, she's in heaven now, who came to our church very faithfully. She had a grandson. She brought him to church with her whenever she came. His name was Rocky. Rocky's still alive, lives in the area. I won't call his last name, but his name was Rocky. He was just a little thing about this high when he was in our church, had just golden yellow hair. He was the epitome, uh, he was the epitome of what a little child that wants to grab your heart should be. He was the kind of kid that if he walked up to you and said, do you have any candy? You'd go down by the candy store for him. I mean, he was a sweet little, little child. Grandma had a nice home, and she had um, a manicured yard, and all of her plants and all were manicured. Beautiful, beautiful place. They came to church one Sunday morning, and I preached some message on hating the devil. You ought to hate the devil. Well, they went home after church. Grandma went in the kitchen and started getting lunch prepared. Little Rocky came home, got in his old clothes, went next door, got the little neighbor boy about his age, came back over, and Grandma was making some lunch, and she looked out the kitchen window, and Rocky was sitting on the ground in her, in her yard, and the other little boy was sitting there. Rocky had a hoe that had the handle broke off. The other little boy had a shovel that the handle was broken off. And they were digging a hole in Grandma's yard. And Grandma couldn't believe it. She got all excited, dropped everything, ran outside. She grabbed little Rocky, picked him up, cutest little boy you'd ever want to see. And she started shaking him and said, Rocky, what are you doing? Why are you digging a hole in Grandma's yard? And he was crying. Tears were coming down to his eyes. And he looked at her and he said, we're trying to find the devil. He said, if we can find him, we're going to kill him. I thought, man, that, that was not the best idea to dig up Grandma's yard, but I sure do like that attitude. We used to say, teach our kids to sing the little song, uh, 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 The Devil is a Sly Old Fox. If I could catch him, I'd put him in a box. I'd lock the box and throw away the key for all the tricks that he's played on me. I'm glad I've got salvation. Listen. The devil is real today. He's after you today. It's not just some little story. You know, sometimes you'll see a little advertisement or something, the devil with a pitchfork and a red suit. And a devil. That's not what it is. The devil is alive. He's real. And his goal is to destroy you. And he's working no less hard at it as he ever has in the history of our world. In fact, we're told in the Bible, as time gets shorter, the devil fights harder. So, I want to talk to you a little bit on this subject, how to beat the devil out of the devil. I'm going to read to you from Exodus chapter number 17, and I'm going to ask if you would stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. I think this is mine. 
Oh, okay, good. All right, we're good. I have to make sure because I don't want to get any diseases. <laughs> All right, let me read beginning at verse 8, chapter 17. Thank you, preacher. Verse number 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Raphidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go, uh, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again today for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for the opportunity to get to preach the Word of God. Thank you that your Word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we understand this morning there's a devil who's real. We understand that he's very powerful. In fact, he is more powerful than we are, and we are no match for the devil in ourselves. But with you, we can beat the devil out of the devil, and I pray that you'd help us to get some things this morning that will help us to do just that, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. The Christian life, and most of you, if you're saved, you know this is true. The Christian life is always a series of battles. The devil attacks. We fight back. God gives a victory. The devil attacks. We fight back. God gives a victory. Then the devil attacks again. We fight back. God gives a victory. It's a series of never-ending battles. So was the history of the people of God. In this story, God had given them a great victory. Don't go back and read it now, but you can go back later and read uh, prior to this. God had just given them a great victory. They came to a place called Rephidim, and there was no water. It was a death sentence for the people. If they didn't get water, they'd be destroyed. God told Moses to take a rod and smite the rock, and when he did, water began to flow to feed or to give drink to all of those people. As the people were now in this chapter rejoicing over the fact of what God had just done, the miracle that God had just given them, suddenly, as always is, the devil attacked them again. The nation of Amalek invaded the camp of the people of God and made war to try to destroy them. When they did, God taught the people of Israel a lesson that they would never forget on how to beat the devil out of the devil. Now, can I say this to you, and then I'm going to just preach quickly here and, and uh, get, get you out on time. Could I say this to you? God never intended for us to allow the devil to destroy us. Amen. Greater is he that's in you Amen. than he that's in the world. God has, God's desire is that we win the battle. By the way, when it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, it's not talking about hell charging the church. It's talking about the church charging hell, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be on the aggressive, and the devil is the one who's supposed to be running. Right. So the Bible says, the Bible tells us that um, that God wants us to get victory over the devil. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, if you want to beat the devil, how many of you have battles going on in your lives? Hold your hand up if you do. I know I do, man. How, ma how many of you can say this? I have something going on in my life that no man can help me, the preacher can't help me, the evangelist can't help me, I can't help myself, I've got something going on. If God doesn't do something, it's not going to get done. Only God can give a victory. Anybody have anything like that? I know I do. I've got some things only God can give me the victory. Well, if we're going to beat the devil out of the devil, 
there are several things that we've got to do. Now, now follow me, and we're going to follow Israel, because Israel eventually won the victory, won the battle against the attack of the devil. We can win that victory too if we will obey what God's teaching us here. So let me give you several things. Number one, if we're going to beat the devil out of the devil, we have to be expecting Satan to attack. Be expecting Satan, always be expecting Satan to attack. Look at verse number 8. And again, I say as I did in Sunday school, sometimes we don't look close enough at the Scripture and get everything gleaned out of it, we can. In verse number 8, the Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Now, I want you to notice the word then. The Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought against Israel and Rephidim. Then. Now, what is that talking about then? When is that talking about? I want to tell you what it means. It's saying, God is saying here, that after God had given a victory, after they had been without water, after God had given a miracle when Moses struck the rock, and water came, and the people are rejoicing, and everything's going good now. Right then, right after that, the Bible says, the devil came and fought again. Can I tell you this? You're in a battle right now, and, and the devil is fighting in your life, whether it be sickness, whether it be finances, whether it be relationships, whatever it is. I'm going to tell you, God can give you the victory, but when he does, the devil will be back with something else to battle you with because he's not going to give up on trying to destroy you. He hates anyone who is serving God. Now, let me tell you, if you want to get the devil off your back, if you want things to go a little bit better, if you want things to be a little bit easier, then I'll tell you how you can do that. Just quit on God. Just give up. Stop coming to church. Don't read your Bible anymore. Don't pray anymore. Don't go soul winning anymore. Don't trust the Lord anymore. And things might ease up a little bit. But I'm going to tell you something. If you are not going to give up on God, if you're going to keep serving God and doing what God wants you to do, you're in for the battle of your life. And every Christian has been, and God has told us not to think it's strange when we suffer persecution. Satan's greatest desire, folk, is to, li is, to, is to send people to hell. And let me stop here and say this. I was going to tell the preacher this a little while ago, and I just didn't get a chance. You, this crowd of people that you have, I, I don't know if preacher knows it or not, but God's using him to build a church here in this area. I mean, this is... This is probably the best crowd we've preached to in a long time. Churches that were running 200, 250, 175 are running 30 and 40 now on Sunday morning, a dozen on Sunday night, just a few on prayer meeting night. I preached for a preacher not long ago. He said, can you preach for me on a Wednesday night? I said, yes, sir, I can. He said, well, let me warn you, I will only have 10 people there on Wednesday night. It's like that preacher everywhere. I'm telling you, the devil has fought. The COVID is a part of it. There's a lot going on to try to destroy the church. If I were the pastor of a church with this crowd here this morning, I'd be jumping up and down and praising God and saying, Hallelujah, God is working in our midst. Amen. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. We need to be expecting the devil attack. And I'm going to tell you this. You, most of your people are pretty good looking. There's a couple that I would... Yeah, but we don't want to talk about Brother Joe today. But um, there's, there's a couple I'd get a little worried about. But listen, you don't look like a rebellious crowd to me. I hope you're not. I'll tell you one thing. It's refreshing to go into church and see Christians who dress like Christians and act like Christians. I don't, it doesn't look like you're in turmoil here. It looks like you're doing pretty good. I'd be praising God because that's not what's happening in a lot of the churches. We need to realize Satan's going to attack. And let me tell you something. If you are doing good, that's wonderful. But if you are doing good, expect the bottom to, draw, to drop out here before long. The devil's going to do everything he can. And it's amazing to me how one bad apple can spoil the whole barrel. And I'll tell you what I did, preacher. I, I watched who came into our church. I watched what's going on. I, I, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm getting away. Let me, so let me go on. So when I get mad, I just go off my trail. Uh, always be expecting Satan to fight. Now, if you're going to beat the devil out of the devil, be, don't be surprised when the fight comes. All right, number two. 
Always be ready to become personally involved in the battle. Always be ready to become personally involved in the battle. Look at the first part of verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose, don't miss these words, choose us, U.S., choose us, out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Now, Moses said to Joshua, choose us out. I said, always be ready to become personally involved in a battle. Moses didn't say, find a bunch of guys to go fight. He didn't say, find a bunch of guys to help you and go fight. He said, choose us. I'm in the battle. You're in the battle. We're all got to be in the battle. Listen, nobody's exempt from this thing. We've got to be ready to get in the battle and fight the battle for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, choose us men, men that will go with us, men that will fight with us and fight with Amalek. Nobody ever wins a battle in any area of life unless you get in the battle. That makes all sense in the world. You're not going to win if you don't get in. God's the one who gives victory but he needs you to be involved. And that's why Paul said in Romans 12, 1, don't miss it. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He said, present your body. I've got news for you. God wants your body to serve him. It's a spiritual warfare. And I don't understand why God does what he does. But he wants your body, he needs your body to serve him. He wants your body to come to Sunday school. He wants your body to be in church. He wants your body to drop your tithes and offerings into the offering plate. He wants your body to read your Bible every day. He wants your body to witness to others and pray and serve him. Our bodies are the tool that God uses to fight against the devil so that we can win the victory, victory over the devil. I'll never forget, when I first got saved, uh, I, I was excited preacher. Amen. And I don't know if you ever knew my preacher back in those old days. His name was John Macon. And Brother Macon was a good, solid preacher. Anybody here ever know John Macon? All right, there in the back, some people knew him. Brother Macon was a good fellow, loved God. He I, I got me saved. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I was excited. I just got saved. And I was excited about the things of God. And I don't know what you do, but when, when I got saved, I followed my preacher. I was with my preacher as much as I could be. I remember this. I'm talking about presenting your body. You know, say, well, you know, my spirit is for God. No, God needs your body too. Amen. And uh, Brother Macon, Pastor Macon, I would hang around him as much as I could. And... Um, and uh, one, well, after the, and by the way, our church auditorium was about half the size this way and about halfway back out back to Brother, Brother Bowie. And that was it. That was the church. And we had 35, 40, 50 people. Brother Macon would have somebody close in prayer, Brother Weaver, and then he would walk to the back of the church, which wasn't very far. Uh, but he walked back to church, and he'd stand there, and as people went out, he would shake hands. Well, I'd watch. I'd, you know, I'd have my eye open during the prayer. And when he got up and went by, I'd get up and I'd follow him. And I'd go to the door with him. And I'd stand. I'm just a kid praying. This kid got saved. And I'd follow him. And I'd stand there with him. And he'd shake hands. And then I'd get to shake hands, you know, when the people they went out. And I just wanted to be near him. I never forgot this. I'm talking about presenting your body. God needs your body. I'll never forget this. A lady came through and she shook the preacher's hand, one of our ladies. And she looked at him and she said, Pastor, she said, that was a good service. She said, I just wanted to let you know, I won't be here tonight, but I'll be with you in spirit. And Brother Macon, he didn't even bat an eye. She said, I, she said, I can't, I'm not, she didn't say I can't be here. She said, I'm not going to be in church tonight, but, I, but I'll be with you in spirit. And Brother Macon looked at her and said, ma'am, if you're not coming, leave your spooks on too. <laughs> I don't need your spooks. God needs our body. God needs us to do something. I've ne Listen, I've never seen a spirit tithe. I've never seen a spirit clean the restroom. God needs our body. So, number one, always be expecting Satan to attack. Number two, be ready at an instant to become personally involved in the battle. Number three, always acknowledge your need of God's intervention. You're expecting the devil to fight. 
You know you've got to get in a battle, but you have always got to acknowledge your need of God's intervention. Look at it in verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose, uh, choose uh, us out men to go and fight with Amalek. Now watch this, that's the physical. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Now he said we're all going to fight, but he said somebody has got to get God in on this thing or it's not going to work, we're not going to win, we're going to fail, we'll lose the battle, we've got to get God in it. He said, get ready to fight, I'm going up on the hill, and I'm going to have the rod of God in my hand, and get God in it. By the way, that was getting God in it, because when he held the rod up, Israel was winning. When the rod went down, when he couldn't hold it up, God withdrew his forces, and, 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 and uh, uh, the Amalekites would win. So, we have got to acknowledge our need. In your own power, folk, you are no match for the devil. Amen. The devil will win every time if you try to battle him in your own power. You have got to have God's help if you're going to win the victory. And by the way, it's been like that all through the Bible. God gave us a whole Bible to show us that we've got to have his help. I remember when Daniel was cast into the lion's den. And... Uh, Daniel would have been devoured by those lions. They starved those lions before they ever threw anybody in there. He'd have been devoured. But Daniel said, listen, Daniel said, God is able to deliver us. The Bible says that God sent his angel. I'm sorry, that, that, that uh, uh, they threw him in the fiery furnace. And uh, while they were in the furnace, they opened the door and looked in again. And the Bible says, somebody, I don't know if it was a king or who it was, but somebody said, uh, didn't we throw three guys in there? And he said, yeah, yeah, three, we threw three in. He said, I got some news for you, Buster. There's four in there now, and one of them looks like the Son of God. And listen to me, I'll tell you why he looked like the Son of God, because he was the Son of God. God got involved in the battle for Daniel. The same way with the three Hebrew children. They'd have been burned to death. They looked down into... Uh, into uh, the furnace. I think I just told you that. Daniel was in the lion's den, forgive me. Uh, but God said the angel shut the lion's mouth. And then in the lion's den, I, I'm sorry, in the furnace. I, I like that because they heated the furnace up seven times hotter. The Bible says then it was wont to be heated. In other words, if they got heated up seven times hotter, then it should have ever been heated for safety's sake. But they threw him in and the Son of God was in there. Same thing with David and Goliath. Well, just a little kid, a little stone. But you know what he said? He said, God delivered me from a bear, delivered me from a lion. He said, he can deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine too. And I, I'll tell you what I believe. I may be, and, if, and by the way, if I'm dreaming, don't wake me up, okay? But i tell you what I believe. I believe David took that little slingshot and boy, and wasn't, you know, this kind of stuff because they didn't have that. It was just two, two leather straps and a little pocket. And he swung it around and let one end go. And I believe God grabbed that rock and put that rock exactly where he wanted it in that giant's head. They, listen, you have got to realize that we have got to have God's help, God's intervention, if we are going to have the victory. Amen. Then let me, give you, let me give you something else. Number four, always follow God's designated leadership. This, every one of these things are important if you are going to beat the devil out of the devil. The devil's going to whip you unless you, these are all important. You don't leave one out and, uh, and think you can get the victory. You've got to be expecting Satan to attack. Don't get caught by surprise. You've got to be ready to become personally involved. You've got to always uh, uh, realize your need of God's intervention, and then you must follow God's designated leadership. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, the first part. Now watch this. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. Boy, what a simple verse. Moses was a leader. Moses said, get you some men, fight against Amalek. And Joshua said, yes, sir. And he followed his leadership and, and obeyed. the. Let me tell you something. God's got a chain of command, and God expects us to follow that chain of command. And we, when we get away from that chain of command, I'm telling you, we're in trouble with God. We're not going to see the victory that we need to see. We've got to always Follow God's chosen leadership. I'm going to make a statement right now, and I want you to listen very carefully. And I want you to take this in. The mark 
of every shattered Christian life. Are you listening to me? The mark of every shattered Christian life is rebellion against God's chosen leadership. And can I tell you something? When you rebel against God's leadership, you rebel against God. Mark it down. You rebel against God. Joshua obeyed the man of God because he knew that that was a part of getting the victory. Beating the devil out of the devil. We follow God's chosen leadership. i got two more and I'm done. And I think I'll be done pretty much on time. Number five, always be a team player. Look, if you will, at verse number 10, the last part of it. The last part of verse number 10 where it says, And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. By the way, I might tell you, any leader's hands get heavy after a while. I'm telling you, I have preachers. I I counsel with a lot of preachers across the country. And they all have the same story. They all tell me, our attendance has gone down to nothing. Nobody in church seems to care anymore about the things of God. I can't get anybody to do anything. And I, I, you have no idea how many preachers have said this to me. My wife and I do it all. We clean the church. We clean the bathrooms. We put the promotion together. We do it all. What a shame. We have, we have to be a team player. There's only one. Now get, get what I'm going to say. I'm almost done, so get what I'm going to say. Because you know what's going to happen in a little bit? You're going to get to do something really spiritual. We're going to eat. We're going to get to eat food. Isn't that something? That's going to be, we are going to eat food, right? Boy, what are they? They don't like food? I didn't get one little word out of them. Oh, they must know what the food tastes like. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to eat. Um, get what I'm saying. This is me. This is how I see it. In God's work, There's only one big wheel, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, I want you to picture in your mind right now a bicycle wheel. Can you picture a bicycle wheel? The tire, the silver spokes everywhere. That's just how I see it. Jesus is the big wheel. He's the only big wheel. Each one of us are spokes in that wheel. I don't have time to get into it. You go to any bicycle shop, and you're having problems with your bike not being steady, and a lot of times all they do is tighten up a few of the spokes that got loose, and the wheel's okay again. So we are spokes in that wheel. Your spoke, your spoke, your spoke, I'm a spoke. Now here's how I see it, and if I'm not right, preacher will tell you. If when I leave, Pastor Sutton gets up and says, don't believe what Burwell told you, <laughs> then I'll know. <laughs> Here's how I see it. One big wheel, that's the Lord. We're all silver spokes in that wheel, but there's one spoke that's a little kind of a gold color because that spoke, still just a spoke, but a little different than the rest of the spokes. And that, I think, signifies the pastor. So we've got a big wheel, that's the Lord. He's our leader. We've got all of us who are spokes in that wheel to do His work, but He's given us one person to to teach us because God wants to, through that spoke, teach the other spokes what they need to do to serve the Lord. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe believe that that, that that's, that's the way God sees it. Joshua obeyed the man of God and then uh, became a team player. Now, that's what it is. As long as you're mad, as long as somebody's mad at somebody else, you've got problems. As long as I want the job you got, I should have got the job you got, we got problems. You know what we need to do? We need just to realize, let me tell you, everywhere I go, preacher, I'd say 80% of the churches where I go, I make this statement. Now, you might rebuke me, you might say, because I've had preachers rebuke me over this statement. But I, may, I make this statement everywhere I, 
80% of every church I go to, somewhere in my message, I tell the people, and I mean this with all of my heart, I am nothing. I'm a nobody. I am nothing. And I say, you say, well, why would you go to a church and say that? I say that most of churches where I go. Why? Because I want to make sure I understand. I'm nothing. God's everything. He's the big wheel. I'm just a little spoke in that wheel. And I realize I'm nothing. I tell God all the time, God, I know I'm nothing. When, I just, when we were coming here uh, to preach and knew it was coming here, I prayed for the services, prayed God has helped me, prayed things would go well. And I prayed and I told the Lord, I said, God, I'm nothing. I don't even know why they're letting me preach here. I'm nothing. I know that. Good night. I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a thoroughbred. I'm just an old curry dog. I'm nothing. But I'm going to tell you something. God is everything, and God's taken a bunch of nothings and used them to get his work done. Amen. Let me give you a last thing. You've got to be a team player. Let me, let me say one thing before I do it, and I'm done. I heard a story about a train that was trying to, it was a steam train, trying to get over a hill. And the, the, the uh, conductor, or whoever it is that runs the train, they, I mean, he was shouting the orders and they were throwing wood in the boiler and coal in the boiler, trying everything they could to get up just enough, enough energy to get over the hill. They, didn't, they, they really thought their lives were endangered. They didn't think they could quite make it over that hill. And they got right up to the top and they threw everything in those burners they could. They did everything they could think of to try to get that locomotive just to go over the top of that hill. And finally they reached the top and the locomotive started to go down. And they realized they were safe. And the conductor said to the, uh, the other people that were working on the train, said, we came that close to dying. Had we not had the train stop before we crest that hill, it would have gone backwards and we would have all been killed. And the guy who was called the brakeman on the train said, I wasn't worried a bit. He said, because I knew we were not going to go backwards. Because he said, the whole time we'd gone up that hill, I was holding the brake on. <laughs> That's not what we're supposed to do, folk. We're supposed to help get the train over the last thing and I'm done. Always expect victory to come. Look at verse 13. I love it. God sums it all up in verse 13. And Joshua dis, uh, discomfited Amalek and, the, and his people with the edge of the sword. When God came into the picture, Israel not only whipped Amalek, but she beat the devil out of the devil. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what your need is this morning. I don't know what your heartache is this morning. I don't know what your problem is this morning. It may have to do with your son or your daughter or somebody you care about, somebody you love. I don't know what your need is. But I'm going to tell you, if you're saved, how many of you saved? Hold your hand up, wave at me if you're saved. All right, if you're saved this morning, you're God's child, and God loves his children 10,000 times more than a human father loves his kids. Brother, let me tell you something. God is for you, and if God be for us, who can be against us? God wants to give you a miracle. God, if you're doing right for God, God wants to take care of your need, and he will. But we've got to learn to beat the devil out of the devil because he's the one that holds back. A lot of times the blessings of God because he gets us to do wrong or gets us not to do what we need to do and God can't answer like he wants to. Can I ask you a question and I'm done, I'll close my Bible. That's the only way I can stop is if I close my Bible. I'll close my Bible. Can I ask you a question this morning? What is it that you need from God that only God can give? What is it? What's that problem? What's that heartache? Who's that person that you love? Maybe their marriage is on the rocks and you've been praying and nothing seems to happen. Or maybe there's a son or a daughter that's not saved. Whatever it is, a thousand things it could be. What's the thing that you need this morning that you can't take care of, preacher can't take care of, no man can take care of, no doctor can fix it? You have to have God's intervention. What is that thing? Now can I say this? I'm not trying to get folk down the aisle. That's between you and God. But I'm going to tell you this. I cannot believe that we have the faith to have God intervene and give a miracle in our lives 
when we're not even willing to get up out of our seat and come down to an old-fashioned altar. We try to get it, get it the easy way. Just sit in your seat. Don't you have to do anything. I have a hard time believing we're showing our faith toward God. If I had something this morning that I needed from God, I don't care how many times I've prayed about it. I don't, have, I don't care how many times I've been down the altar with it. I bring it to the cross and leave it there. You're in an old-fashioned church. Use the old-time Bible. Preacher preaches the old-time messages and truths of the Word of God. Let me tell you something. The altar is not something the preacher decided on. It's not something that I invented. The altar is something where, that God gave us to come and to meet with Him. Can I meet with God in my seat? Sure I can. Everywhere I go, He lives inside of me. But for some reason, check the Old Testament. For some reason, whenever they had big, big stuff to do with God, they'd build an altar. I'm saying this altar just fits your needs. God wants to give you a miracle. Why don't you come and do some business with God? Let's all stand together as we have our invitation. God speaking to your heart this morning. Why don't you just bring that thing to the cross?